Hi there. The Lean Into Art Cast. Show where a couple of visual storytellers get together, take a walk around a topic, try to talk about it in some kind of abstracty way, some kind of like how conceptual, uh, exploratory way. And then we try to close with a more practical ways to put this stuff into action way. We think hard about visual storytelling, so you will too. My name is Jersey Drozd, cartoonist and teaching artist. The other host is... Hi, I'm Rob Stenzinger. I am a coder and designer and facilitator. How you doing, Rob? I'm doing pretty well. How about you, Jersey? I'm okay. And uh, I, you know, <laughs> I know why I'm okay. Yeah, why? I, I often wonder why. <laughs> you wonder why? I, you wonder why about everything, or, or just wondering why I'm why I'm doing okay? Uh, both. Oh, <laughs> every day on the bus, Rob's thinking, how how is it that he's okay? Uh, because I've been doing satisfactory chunking of my work to make it manageable and sustainable. And while I'm never going to get ahead, uh, I at least don't feel panicked and overwrought. I feel wrought, but not overwrought. How about you? <laughs> I, I'm at a similar life stage where there's a, um, there's a certain peace to be had where you're at the edge of a lot of um, activity and change and progress and new information and all sorts of stuff while um, not falling into it and, you know, just somehow, you know, going into a swirl of whatever is at the bottom of the swirl um, and yet not worried about it. It's uh, and I do think that that chunking is is a, is a thing that helps like, uh, you know, give context. And, I mean, the word itself is pretty descriptive as to what we're talking about, but we're going to spend the next hour and change talking about this idea of chunking and prioritizing and dividing realms of concern in order to not crack up under the weight of a project. Ongoing, mm -hmm. short-term, any kind of project. Uh, so a little bit, uh, maybe a little bit of time managing stuff, a little bit of workflow stuff, a little bit of observational stuff. And uh, a little bit of um, learning from experience stuff all coming up on this episode of the Lean Into Artcast. But before we go there, Rob. Mm. Yes. Something happens. Yeah. Something happens. <laughs> 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 What's going to happen? Well, we like to, um, we, we, we mentioned our sponsor, which is us right now because, well, um, this 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 project is here to uh, share thoughts and be of service to our audience and chewing through the topics just like you described. And in order to make that sustainable, uh, we do other projects. And this is a good opportunity for us to mention those projects. That's right. So uh, I'll start with one of Rob's projects. So Rob mentioned that he's a coder, a designer, and uh, game designer. Mm -hmm. And you made a game called This Panda Needs You, and it's at this-panda.com. And the premise is very straightforward. I don't want to say simple. It's straightforward. Uh, panda walks onto the scene, and there's some blocks neatly stacked. And the panda says, that's nice. That's very geometric, and I really appreciate uh, well-conceived art. But along comes this mischievous cloud who blows on the art and tumbles the blocks to the ground. And poor panda needs your help in rearranging the blocks. It's a little bit of little bit of physics game. It's a little bit of pattern memorization um, geared towards children. It's for oh, it's iOS, so it's iPad, iPhone. Uh, but you know, as we have as many of us have learned, games like Yoshi's Cookie, uh, you know, some of these games can be powerfully relaxing for adults as well. Something to play with your kids too. So that's at this-panda.com. If you go to the website, that'll take you to the link to the iTunes App Store where you can get it today. And there are two things you can do as far as uh, supporting some awesome work by Jersey Drozd, which are at, uh, well, it's it's boulderandfleet.com, right? But then guess what? You could also go to patreon.com slash uh, Jersey Drozd, right? No, just my first name. Just Jersey. Okay, awesome. All right, so patreon.com slash jersey also gets you there, and that actually gets you like, you know, potentially behind-the-scenes things when you actually support him at, at patreon.com slash jersey. And, well, why would you do that? Because this is an amazing comic. This is his, you know, this is a culmination of his life's work uh, expressing cute animals doing awesome, adventurous things 
and uh, that is that's completely awesome. You need to check it out at boulderandfleet.com and see how there's this bear and a bird who go on adventures and write that which is wrong, much like you would hope they would do. <laughs> <laughs> I've been but it's not straightforward. It's 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 you know there's a lot of uh, ups and downs in this this journey here, and uh, you know I recommend going to that uh, that link, but then also clicking on first as quick as you can so you can take that ride. Page yeah. Page. Uh, one thing that I will say that I think is one of my strengths as a storyteller is writing casts, like bickering groups of people, uh, mm-hmm. and that's something I enjoy doing, and I think that that joy comes through in the characters. So that's that's something to, to expect from there. It's it's not just pure like oh there's people let's help them oh we help the people let's go home. It's more about watching cats in a sack all scream at each other like fr- like all good friendships. Um, but besides uh, the stuff we make outside of Lena Tart, if you're here just for the Lena Tart stuff and you're like I like the way Jersey and Rob think about storytelling, I like the way they break stuff down, I like the way that they they process and redistribute or redeliver uh, information. Then you can go to leanintoart.com slash workshops. And that has some videos that we've made that you can download at a price of your choosing, even zero. You can get Comics Fundamentals, which is a four-session series about a a soup-to-nuts approach to making comics. Um, Rob's got some storyteller UI tools. Uh, Turning jokes into comics, Laughing Yeti, Monkey Spaghetti. I've seen this this workshop live. Uh, Super fun. And also making video games from comics. So... Proof, it's a, it's a workshop series or workshop video that proves that if you know how to make comics, you know how to make video games as well. At least the theory of video games, right? Mm-hmm. Leanatart.com slash workshops. And thanks everybody for helping to spread the word about our personal projects or supporting us in whatever way that you do, whether by purchasing Rob's app or by spreading the word about Boulder and Fleet or by buying one of our workshops at leanatart.com. So... Are we ready? We are ready. Time to go 10,000 feet up. Let's talk about this topic in abstract. This is the part of the show where we discuss the hows of the topic. Yeah, the hows and the why. Not the hows, it's the whys. I'm getting mixed up, Rob. It's a little more, yeah. <laughs> you might step in a how, but we'll typically say, wait a minute. We're going to save that for later. <laughs> I stepped um, in a how, Rob. Oh, man. That happens sometimes. It's okay. <laughs> um, Is that a Minnesota curse word? <laughs> no. Yo, know, that's just a load of how, you know? Oh, that's... Well, hey, Midwest back at you. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, there's... Uh, <laughs> all right, 10,000 feet up. We're thinking about uh, a lot of the why and what and why and kind of just facing the topic, saying like, okay, chunking. Well, what do we mean by that? And uh, and we we explore we wander it around we wander around it but but uh, instead of just stopping there of course you know that we're gonna go further later on yeah so what do so, we mean by yeah so let's talk about this chunking thing because I yeah. came across this recently uh, in one of my I, I'm in the process of wrapping up uh, four different classes I've been teaching in Ann Arbor four different comics classes and mm-hmm. um, I caught one of my students caught i discovered one of my students sort of trying to take on too many parts of the process of making a comic all at once like they're trying to do sort of like their uh their their shot choice their figure construction and their color choice all in one go and i said whoa hold on you know this is a lot for you to process at once why not take fight one of those battles at a time and so then I went up to the board and I showed, like, sort of like, here's how I chunk out a page of Boulder and Fleet. And I saw this look of sort of like, I don't want to say relief, but so more of like a, like a, like a, oh, yeah, you can sort of take on different things at different stages, which I feel so like. What does that we, look like if you're not doing that? Like, what would, so help yeah. me, help me see what that, what that is. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll put it to you like this take a car, and this is going to be like a, kind of a silly grandpa analogy, but (laughs) take a car and completely disassemble it and mix up all the parts all over the driveway and say, Mm -hmm. make a car, right? Hmm. And I think we intuit, actually I wanted to put this to you, whether or not we intuit a process to this because one of the first questions is where do I start? I remember when I was a little kid and my parents would say, clean your room. And I'd be like, well, I don't know where to start. You know, I mean, I, I really didn't know. I'd look around the room like, well, what do I put away first? 
and where do I put it? Um, that procedure wasn't immediately apparent to me. Um, so the way it looks is, is confusion, frustration, and sort of spitballing and sort of like kludging things together going like, is this it? Is this it? It starts heuristically, right? Until somebody gives you some kind of a, a process. Am I off base well, there? I mean, well, I, I don't think you're off base at all, but I do think it's potentially discoverable too, because you may run into sort of uh, natural constraints and friction where it's like, this is frustrating. Um, I kind of lost track of what I'm trying to tackle here. Uh, wh what am I trying to get accomplished or whatever? Cause you, cause you can get mired into so many different potential, um, you know, aspects instead of, you know, addressing them separately. So this like one symptom would be, um, being overwhelmed and yeah. yeah. Um, or let's see, then noticing potentially. So the symptom itself could lead to discovery too, right? Where you're like, well, wait a minute. What if I try? And you could so, so trial and error may lead to figuring it out. But then a great shortcut is if someone's like, you know what? Here is a framing for what you're trying to pull off, and this is a constructive way to to tackle what you're trying to get done. Break it into separate jobs, or what have you. Right. Now I remember as a child being exposed very early on to at least uh, in, intimation at procedure in that. Having been a kid who always wanted to make comic books when he grew up, um, I noticed in my comic books that there were different credits listed. Pen writer, penciler, inker, colorist, letterer, right? So like, wow, all these people mm. do different jobs. And I at least had enough sense to know that, well, they can't possibly be all on the page at the same time, right? Okay. You can't have five people all hovering around a comics page doing all of that at once. So they must do it at different times, right? I, I at least had that much of a clue early on. But I'm also reminded of, you know, the, the, the novice thing where you see you see something, you're arrested by something, I want to do that. You see the way Eddie Van Halen plays a guitar, I want to do oh, that. Geez. I, I yeah. don't know how he does it, but it, cause it looks like magic, but I want to do exactly that. And so, like, you start by trying to copy that finger tapping, right? Oh, you know the finger tapping he does? I'm going to do that, right? Uh, <laughs> you don't think, like, well, I better learn my chords and I better learn you know, what all the strings mean and everything. It's like, well, if I just look, look at the way he's doing it. And it's the same thing with drawing, too. It's like you just try to copy that surface feature that you immediately see. Well, the, Scott Lobdell uses this kind of cross-hatching. I'm just going to do that kind of cross-hatching. Why isn't it working? You know. So I do remember, even though I was aware of there was some kind of procedure, it wasn't immediately clear to me. And also, my understanding of what went into making the drawing. I didn't know the difference between penciling and inking when I was a kid. Mm. You know, it was just the drawing. It was just there, right? And we... And again, sounding like grandpa, I didn't have YouTube videos to like reveal that to me right away. So it was a, it, it, it was something where I had to kind of sort of reverse engineer through trial and error sometimes. Wow, yeah, seeing the process is amazingly beneficial because I mean, and that is a is a very abundant resource for almost anything you want to study now. Mm -hmm. um, like literally, you don't just look at um, well. The classic uh, metaphor I like to abuse is like the, the the old style cooking shows would have the the kind of like the double decker oven, and would be like, well, here's some stuff you do, and then they skip some steps, and then they go over to the oven, and they put it in the one side, and then reach to the next the bottom side and pull out the finish thing. It's like, wait, what? How, <laughs> there was something happened there, and you know. Yeah. All right. So now, so how I, yeah, you see the fully baked thing. You don't see the process of, of assembling and whatnot. Where just doing that can be such a huge, I mean, this is almost stepping in a how, right? But like um, that context, if you're lacking it, is I think part of the confusion. Maybe. Yeah. Well, I, 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 I agree. That part of that, missing that context adds to the confusion. And then I was just talking about this on the Galaxy of Super Adventure show with my buddies uh, Ben Hatke and Zach Gialongo about how... Which is a fantastic uh, show you, everyone should subscribe to in their podcatcher. Thank you. But, yeah. uh, At uh, comicsagreat.com slash GOF. Yeah, GOSA, sorry. Um, GOSA. But we were talking about how um, the musical montage in films is both like exactly how our brains work but also like really treacherous, right? It's like it's like the greatest lie we've ever told ourselves, but it's a pretty awesome lie. 
Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, I got to work hard to do this thing. Well, awesome music's going to play, and then it's going to be about 10 minutes of me kind of like doing this really hard and then maybe screwing up a little bit. Maybe the, maybe the teacher goes, mm, mm, mm. But then I go back and I do it again, and suddenly it's working and it's going great. And whoo, now I'm awesome at this thing, you know? <laughs> so that, that too, I think, is at work. Is that, like, that, the context of the amount of effort that goes into it is something that, and I don't think there's any amount of telling or showing you can do uh, I, I remind my students of that a lot, and I've been in my latest round of classes, I was having some artists actually visit my classrooms to sort of like bolster that messaging. Um, I think it's a message that can be placed to a novice to sort of provide them comfort when it gets tough. That, okay, well, a lot of people that I respect said there's a lot of long-term effort and it's going to be grueling, but I don't think that, that hearing that message alone doesn't provide that context, mm -hmm. right? No, yeah, that's a very good point. It, that's um, one of those ones you really have to experience it. So, and not all up. videos actually provide that context. Some willfully hide it. Um, yeah. I, I'm not going to name names. I saw a video the other day sampling some. Uh, now, now I won't even provide any direction, but I saw it, it essentially someone presenting exactly the opposite of what we're saying, where it's essentially one day they could just draw. Oh, and boy. It, it, I, was, I only watched it longer because I was so shocked I couldn't hit stop. <laughs> and uh, like such an unexamined assumption exists in someone that skilled. <laughs> wow. Okay. Interesting. Um, world's a big <laughs> oh, place. Let me capture that. Yeah. Such an unexamined assumption. <sighs> yeah. But... Um, but yeah, so the, you may not, you know, your mileage may vary depending on what uh, sort of procedural videos you, you check out. <laughs> right. And, and like I said, all I was trying to do there was just kind of navigate very quickly and briefly this notion that some, in, some of this can be transmitted, some of it has to be experienced, right? You cannot transmit wisdom, right? right you transmit yeah. information. And yeah. Like a lot of times when you're framing a class, you're not actually dumping knowledge out of your brain into other brains right there's no sync sync cables going on it's all uh hey here's a scenario let's go through that and uh what was that like and now let's go through another one and maybe there's a progression that builds toward um some uh some practice and yeah. experience so uh you want to dig into you know chunking like what we actually mean by it. Hmm. Um, I, okay. Like taking one, one simple swing at it is like the, uh, there isn't the instant, you know, cake door. You, can, you can't just pull a complete project out of some magic door. Uh, that would be one chunk that's no effort and in magic, right? Um, so how, how, many, <laughs> how many chunks does it take, Mr. Owl, to, uh, <laughs> yeah. to make Three? a thing? Three. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, and like, I recognize the 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 friction this instantly creates because the next question is, well, like you said, how many chunks does it take? How do you know how many chunks it takes? Mm -hmm. uh, boy, oh boy, you know that's that's gonna change project to project. Sometimes that's gonna change as your experience changes. Um, that's going to change based on how much information you have at the outside of the project, how much experience you have with it at the outside of the project. Is this your first time making this particular thing? Uh, is this your 50th time making this particular thing? Right. There's always variables, right? Yeah. Performance. Like, okay, I set aside, I set aside some kind of intention and plan for the day or whatever, or this, or this set of weeks. And there's this assumed progression because I have done chunking, but then as you perform variables and all of a sudden stuff can change and you may have to adapt your chunks. Um, there isn't, yeah, that's not like it's a recipe either for, um, uh, instant progression. And for me, chunking typically has a lot to do with the way, the way I think I think. And what I mean by that is, is that I really am not, I don't feel particularly great at multitasking. Um, when whatever task I'm set to, I have to give it like 90% of my cognitive faculties. It's even hard for me sometimes to have something with too much dialogue happening in the background, like listening to podcasts, listening to television or whatever. 
certain tasks, I can't even have that going because it's too much of a distraction. I really need to give all my focus to this thing. So, so I'm curious, I, will it throw it, will it derail you to, to dive into like which, which task would be for which situation, for example? Not necessarily. No, no. I mean like, yeah. so um, writing, even writing an email, right? Mm-hmm. Even if I'm just responding to somebody's email about something like, thanks so much for your notes. Uh, I'll get these changes turned around on Thursday and I'll bill you on Friday, right? Constructing that message, that requires all of my cognitive that, that like 90% of my attention needs to go to that. Like if I have anything else playing in the background, it's too easy to distract me. Hmm. Um, other I things. Actually, I find the same thing, by the way. That's it. That's very interesting. Yeah. Spoken words. Yeah. Just take up, take up my ability to put out words. Yeah. If they're in the yeah. yeah. So like writing things, writing is like, I need almost silence. I mean, actually 90% of the time I need silence when I write and it's kind of, hmm makes the experience a little bit more intense sometimes and it bums me out a little bit, you know, because I don't have anything to like buoy me while I'm doing this thing. You know, I don't get mm. to listen to Eye of the Tiger <laughs> while I'm writing, you know. Um, so so that, that one's like, I kind of have to like limit it to smaller chunks of time as well in order to manage my energy, right? And that's where we can get into like in the second half of the show, we talk about things like mm. measurement and how, what we discover through measurement. But um, so, but because of that, because of like something I discovered about myself over the years of doing this work is that I realize uh, if I have too many concerns surrounding a particular task, it makes the process go slower. I do uh, work of poor quality and I feel worse about it. So by limiting my concerns to as few concerns as possible so I can give that one concern my undivided attention and really only attend to it and trust myself that whatever other bits of concern go into this project will be attended to after the completion of this particular concern. That's what I mean by chunking. Chunking is not just about uh, time management as it is about attention management. And, uh, and, I underst- and I acknowledge and understand that not every project works well with that approach because I've tried it with other projects, like projects where I'm touching the same thing over and over again that's passing through many hands and coming back to me, you know, where there's more cooks in the kitchen or more voices in the room, um, becomes a little bit more difficult for me to, to chunk that way. But when I'm talking about projects where it's placed in front of me and I'm just told to go for it. So that's like doing freelance art, storyboards, comics, doing my own personal comics, creating graphic novels for publishers, you know, having those realms of concern sort of chunked out, uh, makes, the attention more manageable to me. Hmm. So it's, there's, there, it's almost like, um, well, uh, I think of it as making making your work systemic, right? And okay. so you can have a complex mean? you can have a complex system, which a system would be a progression of stages that is likely uh, repeatable. Well, and in, in, that's implied because the system would then cycle at some point. Um. So that's kind of, I mean, it, won't, well, it sounds hand wavy, but like, are you going to do that job again? Um, it would be one question. Then maybe you want a system for that. Uh, are you going to do that a, a lot or infrequently? Are you going to, um, how does it feel when you do it? And, also, and again, well, like when you get into all that, that's, yeah, approaching measuring stuff. But um, then when I think of what it, what is chunking, it's, a one of those kind of stages you would place into a system and that each one of those stages would be a chunk right and then each of those ch- <laughs> i don't know if i've said chunk so many times in, in <laughs> such a short period but like this episode uh, is sponsored by chunky by the way <laughs> it should be um chunky soup <laughs> chunky candy bars um <clears throat> anyway um what moves your work forward what moves my work forward that is a that's a uh chunk yeah. And yeah. And and then like uh I name that based on like well what happened and and how do I describe that? Um how did I progress things like and it really depends on what I'm working on for that. Is it is it um is it a single illustration? Is it a, is it a, is it a book or is it a game? Is it a presentation? Is it a workshop? Um but each of those has some kind of progression. Yeah. Yeah. Away. Um and in progression, come, we come back to that word procedure, right? 
which again is something that's discoverable instruct it, you can instruct it to someone but it's not immediately impar- apparent to people so who's going to go devil's advocate on this yes please like so procedure wait a minute we're talking art we're talking storytelling don't don't nail down my world and work man like how do you how start are gonna... on page one and you just yeah. start typing until you get to page 300 yeah well that's how i do line. <laughs> no or or like hey if, if that's not how i did how i did it that's how it was meant to be for that moment that project i'm never thinking about you know doing this again if i do this again what's you know is that art anymore right or or flip side uh if i don't do it that way i'm not a real insert name here right you got to use this kind of pen you got to use this kind of software you got to use this kind of workflow right? i bought into that school of thinking oh oh no i'm out of i've yeah now i'm failing out of that school yeah am i yeah. am i labelable anymore <laughs> <laughs> am i labelable <laughs> i don't want to lose my label <laughs> uh Gosh, I'm, I'm t- that's honestly terrible. <laughs> but, you know, it, it can feel like, um, well, I mean, heck, I've, I've, I felt quite comfortably labelable, uh, labelable uh, <laughs> doing the, the whole sort of uh, like 2008 and 9 era of webcomic practices, right? Where it was like, yeah, we just all kind of, a lot of us believe this. This is the recipe. This is what you do. And then when I wasn't working with that recipe, I was like, oh, no. Uh, you know, losing my label. Losing my label, yeah. Or, yeah. or yeah, th- 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 there's like a whole like sub discussion we get into about like tribalism and symbols and things like that. Mm. Mm-mm. Super hoping we haven't lost each other. Wondering if we might have. Um... Let's see. I think I should quickly text Jersey to see if we're still uh we're still live. How are we doing? Um let's see if I can multitask because thinking of um thinking of so we're, we're each kind of hitting our own angle of of like what how do we defi- define and wrap our heads around this, this kind of chunking thing when do you run into when it would be natural to to sort of start to try to do that um and and i suppose like a, a place to go with this pretty soon from here would be what um what feels better about it and the, the sort of you know a little more of the incentive as far as well why why would you do it because I think we're getting getting to some of those some of those things and uh, whatnot but there's a uh, um yeah that looks like Jersey dropped offline but there there's yeah there's a lot to it so let's see. I think Jersey will be back very shortly. Thanks for hanging in there. Um, let's see. Do to do vamping and multitasking. Yeah, not doing awesome at the multitasking. I'm thinking about tweeting. Um, we're live now with Lean into Art. And I see that uh, Jersey's back. I am back. That was my nightly internet outage. Uh, let me set my microphone up again. Okay, sounds good. There we go. Yeah. Well, yes. these things happen. Yeah. Doing live shows on the internet. So, okay. So, um, what would be okay? We 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 hit a little bit of that the the devil's advocate thing as far as the chunking. Um, and I mean, I think overall that kind of port points to a little bit of a theme, like a lot of times when we try to put on that hat, um, I don't know if we always do it total justice because we have similar biases, but, um, but it's the classic, um, you know, commercial art versus, you know, um, the, the sort of, uh, fine art, uh, arguments and 
inherently there's i mean it's like well what what do you end up valuing you know who's you know do you want to have a lot of output do you want to have a lot of learning and discovery then you know these are kind of incentives toward doing some kind of systematizing or um you know making repeatable portions of work um and and embracing that somehow because chances are if you're doing this to engage in trade you're going to be doing it a lot and mm -hmm. uh that's right and so i was wondering if it would be worthwhile to go for just like a minute or two into um mm -hmm. situations where a lack of awareness of process got us right where it bit us <laughs> Or is, is that is that useful, like cautionary tale, or just like case in point of when we learn to respect process a little bit more? Mm. What's funny is, um, yeah, I mean, I would love to. Let's take a swing at that. Um, okay. Yeah. For I mean, for me, I, it reminds me of like I, I didn't start to have a great appreciation for process until both so, like there's a there's a couple of big leaps for me. It's like when I got into collaborative software development and then I started to think to leak some of that thought out to my other disciplines where I'm like well wait a minute I probably could make music a little better if I did that or I could probably do you know do my art a little bit better if I find out like um, you know what's a better set of stages instead of like you know painting myself in a corner literally with uh, you know some work that I just didn't plan out and all of a sudden it's not laid out well for where I you know how I wanted to use it in the game <laughs> that kind of thing mm -hmm. um, but so there was that where um, yeah just you know collaborative software development but then the next one was uh, when I did study uh, some martial arts for a few years and I gained a far better appreciation because of I think the hard limit like there's hard skills kind of th idea of, of, of you know there's skills that sort of require a ton of practice it's not just like I shared a, a thought or procedure with you. Now you own that skill at the level of a master. There's stuff that you have to practice a ton to get good at. And uh, I know that natural limitation and how uh, working with the procedures that I was being taught, like I, I just I saw like, wow, this is actually pretty darn helpful for um, getting better. I think in, in encountering a good teacher to helps one appreciate and understand process, right? <coughs> because the, a, a good instructor will introduce you to the information you need to know just at that particular moment, right? Mm. They'll be mindful of where you are, what you need to know, what you want to know, and then deliver, here you go, try this now, and then see how that builds into this, right? That is so, amazing, yeah. But yeah, for me, it was it was also, you know, and I know I've told the story years ago, uh, I, when I worked at a newspaper, that was when I got the um, the insight of having a clear visual understanding of where you are with a project, like what difference that makes. So like I was uh, working in a newspaper doing graphic design for like the ad department, uh, just for like 13 regional circulars so it was like those like those things you get in your mailbox that you recycle right away right like where it has like mm. pizza coupons and dry cleaning coupons and stuff like that not like super glamorous graphic design um but there would be like i don't know 30 or 40 of those ads per circular so we'd have 13 in hooks up and that had to be all on the out hooks by the end of the week so like at a glance i could look at this wall and see like okay these go we're watching the week slowly get whittled away right so instead of having all the ads in a pile, like chunking them out into these are the ones you're doing on Monday, these are the ones you're doing on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, right? And then here's here's two different states that they will exist in so that you know at a glance where you are with everything, right? That was a big insight. So yes, working with groups can be hugely instructive. But also um, another story I know I've told a bunch before is back in the 90s when I was first starting out and I was self-publishing my own comics and doing them all through the mail, like mail order kind of thing. Uh, I didn't plan ahead. I did. I, each page was like I was. I was writing, penciling, inking, lettering, all at the same time, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got six issues in. I don't know how many pages that is because some of the pages, some of the books were like twenty-five pages, some were like forty. So it was a lot of pages. I got quite a ways in. And because I didn't plan ahead, because I didn't think about it very hard as I was doing it, and I was faking my way through, uh, 
I had a, a, a roadblock with the story where I just didn't know what I wanted to do anymore. And, like, life stuff was happening at the time and everything. So it was just all this stuff, like, kind of collided with the fact that I didn't, I didn't break it into a procedure in any way. So I had no way to recover. Um, hmm. Right? And so it was after that that I said, okay, never again. I don't ever want to go through that experience again. I'm always going to plan ahead, and I'm always going to try to break this into the absolute minimum realms of concern so that I can accomplish each of these tasks and tick them off the list, right? So as not to have that damned blank page staring at me with that huge thunderous noise of, like, you can't do it, <laughs> you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's pretty daunting. The uh, that's a really interesting thing you point out. So like recovery is almost that's a sign of you know, a potentially helpful system or or a way to chunk things, um, and that reminds me a lot of of how we've described a few uh, a, a, a few different times. Um, when I when I think of something as as sort of a, a whittle a whittleable project, so you may have like your your main projects which may have their approach to chunking, that could assume that well okay a big portion of my day is dedicated to this. So it's going to be really, you know, in my space, right? I'm going to walk into this project and whatever, but then there's other things that's like, it's going to be put away. It's not in my space and I need to be able to take it out and uh, be productive where that's like a whittling project. And so that's like a different sort of chunking where, yeah, yeah this is only, this is something I need to be able to, to be productive with for five to 15 minutes on the bus. Yeah. And yeah, different different set of concerns. Totally. And so that is a wonderful segue into saying that in about a one minute and 30 seconds, we're actually going to show how we navigate these concerns. We're going to explore some actual chunking techniques that we use, and we will conclude with some thoughts on how the chunking process can be um, evolved and how it can grow over time through good data capturing techniques, right? Well, good data... Uh, intentional data capturing techniques I'll, I'll 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 say that so but before we do that so like i said you know we're gonna we're getting to the how in just a second here but before we do that we try to make this show sustainable uh and one of the ways we do that is through patreon patreon.com slash lean into art and uh this is a it's like it's an ongoing kickstarter kickstarter for ongoing projects where you can contribute an amount of your choosing be deducted every month or contributed to us at every, every month and uh, we're trying to hit a goal of $800 per month to make our time you know to pay for our time in making this show every two weeks and when I say every two weeks actually between each show we do a show called Extra Lean which you can get at our Patreon site and that, that's just the show where you know, we just hawk around kick around an idea do an emergent topic and we have people who support us on there and we want to thank five of them right now so first thank you Kelly Ishikawa Facebook.com slash Kelly Ishikawa. Thanks so much for supporting us on the show. Jay Taylor at Taylor underscore FS3 on Twitter. You're the comic book artist uh, on the square comics.com. And then Jesse Hughes at Plummy Press on Twitter. Also Plummy Press.blogspot.com. Uh, let me get my list here. Mark Falk at the underscore Chagall. S H A G A L. And it's also the underscore Chagall.com. That's where you can find Mark's comic. And Catherine Sugru, at Kat Sugru on the Twitters. Another cartoonist at mudskipper.the-comic.org. Thanks so much for uh, everybody <laughs> who's contributed to our Patreon and helped make this show more sustainable. Your support means a lot to us. So, mm, Thank you very much. Well, hey. Ready hey, to go Jersey? on the ground? Uh, yeah. It's time to get tactical. All right. <laughs> This is on the ground, the part of the show where we take all this thinking, all this conceptual stuff, and try to put it in some kind of actionable, useful procedure. We're gonna we're gonna make procedure out of procedure, the procedure of procedure. <laughs> Turn it into a Smurf word. So <laughs> it's uh, <laughs> that, but right. I mean, it's practical. That's a, that's the idea of this, where where it's okay. Well. This could be stuff that you can try, or you could say, like, no way, I have tried that. Either way, it should be, um, yeah, more tangible, handy stuff, and that's uh, that's what this section's about. Um, so, Jersey? You uh, want me to take lead on it? Yeah. I made a spreadsheet, and I did this out of respect for you, Rob, 
I know you like the spreadsheets. <laughs> it does say it comes from the heart when you say that, man. I did, well, I like them too. I mean, you and Anne have really turned me. I mean, I was one of those artists who was like, ah, data organization and structuring. Blah, that's that's what that's what smart people do, not uh, delicate, sensitive artists like me. Um, <laughs> you guys turned me around. I think they're great now. Um, so I made a spreadsheet that I shared publicly, and we will link to it in the show notes. I'm going to pull it up right now, and I'll walk through the way I chunk uh, my comic. This will be a, a, a case in point. This isn't every project, but this is, uh, you know, Boulder and Fleet, as you described when you're talking about, like, is this something you're going to be doing a lot of? This is something I'm doing it every week. Every week I'm going through this process, and so this is something that I want to to have happen as smoothly as possible and with as little bit little of a time impact as possible. Sometimes it's going to take more time, sometimes it's going to take less, but let's try to make this thing happen as smoothly and as efficiently as I possibly can, right? I don't mm -hmm. think that's unreasonable. I don't think that's unartistic in this particular case. So uh, step one, chunk one, I should say, thumbnails. So thumbnailing, um, this is doing the loose sketches of the page, right? Just like a, a and actually, let me pull up actually have my thumbnails here so I can show the size of them on the screen so everybody can get a sense of scale here. How about that? Mm -hmm. um, and I should pull up, oh, it's an old page I got here, so it won't be spoiling anything in this story. So we're looking at 8.5 by 11 sheet folded in half, square drawn in the middle. The square is maybe 4, 4.5 four yeah, inches by 4.5 yeah, inches. Somewhere in there. Roughly half the size of the final printed page. So like the final page size is 8 inches by 8 inches or 300 dpi, okay? So thumbnails, I'm not thinking about drawing it right. I'm not thinking about, uh, you know, final dialogue. Uh, I'm not thinking about, you know, uh, anatomy, line value. I'm not thinking about color theory. All of those concerns. I push to the side and say, I will deal with that later. I'm only going to concern myself with two things here. And one is the writing, which is to say, moment choice am i looking up or am i looking down at the thing am i, am I close up to it am i far away from it is it a diagonal shot um you know is it a big panel is it a small panel what are the characters actually doing you know is fleet flying away is she flying toward is boulder lifting a thing is he putting it down that kind of stuff plot characterization and for lack of a better term cinematography is what i'm thinking about at this stage which is a lot of stuff um and then i'm also thinking about visual composition how are these things interacting with one another on the page Although, I know that my visual composition is not done yet. This is sort of my first draft of it. So let's, let's approach it. Let's do a draft of the visual composition, how the elements all interact with one another, knowing that I get a do-over later on if I need it, okay? Chunk two, lettering. So once my thumbnails are done, I import it into Manga Studio. And as you can see on the screen, I turn the, the thumbnails into blue line. And now I go in and I do the lettering. And the, the two things I'm figuring out here are what's the final dialogue? Because sometimes I think I had more room than I originally had. on the, Or rather, I think I had more room at the thumbnail stage that I don't have when I go to final art, right? Mm -hmm. Like, oh, I wish I could have put those three more sentences in there. Can't. Figure something else out. So I'm, I'm tweaking the dialogue. But I'm also figuring out the composition. What's the word balloon flow going to be on here? And you can see in chunk one, Boulder's balloons got split in panel three, right? It was originally designed as one complete balloon, but then when I got to the uh, lettering stage, I was like, you know, it needs to be broken into two for flow reasons and for pacing reasons. Um, and at this stage, the art will get adjusted to accommodate the lettering. So I'll, you know, take my lasso tool and move sketched bits around to say like, okay, well, this is gonna be, have to be lowered, this is gonna be moved to the left, and so on to accommodate some of these lettering choices I've made, right? Once that's done, uh, I shut off the lettering layers, and then I go into my pencil roughs. Pencil roughs is just a layer over top of my thumbnails, where, as you can see, it's just a very loose and sketchy version of the final art. It's a little bit more polished than the thumbnail, but it's still pretty loose. And what am I worried about at this stage? Okay, the battle has been won on the writing. I don't have to think about that anymore. Battle has been won on the lettering. Final dialogue has been chosen, and that composition has been beaten. Done with that. Don't think about it anymore. Now all you have to think about is shape, you know, getting the shapes of the characters right, anatomy, you know, am I getting everything anatomically correct? Am I getting like the, the, the mine cart, all of its details in the right places? The, the, you know, this one had a wheel broken off. There's so many crystals buried into the side of the mine cart and so on. And the, the structure of the characters. Do they look like they're standing in three dimensions? 
uh, do they look like they actually exist as real creatures to the best of my ability, right? And then once that's done, I go to final pencil stage, right? Oh, oh, I've got timings on here. I should have been saying that. So mm. thumbnails, I spend about 30 minutes. I, these are approximate numbers. These are by no means like hard and fast. I got an egg timer and boom, 30 minutes, got to move on. Uh, sometimes it takes more, sometimes it takes a little less. Um, so thumbnails, the part where I'm just sketching, about 30 minutes a page. Lettering takes about 45 minutes a page. A little bit more noodly, a little bit more time consuming. And then pencil roughs is 45 minutes per page. Then when I go to pencils, okay, I've conquered all those other concerns. I've whittled all of those away. Now what are, what are my two big concerns at this stage? Um, I'm worried about line quality, line value. Again, knowing I get a do-over later on when I get to inks, this is sort of a first draft. Line value, you know, am I using thick lines or thin lines to create, create a sense of distance, to create a sense of perspective, create a sense of weight, create a sense of light source. Um, clarity of the illustration. Is the illustration clear? Do, do we understand where all the elements are? Do we have tangents? Right? Are things inter interacting with each other on the page in a weird way to create confusion? Um, that's all I'm worried about at this stage. I'm not thinking about color i'm not thinking about shading i'm not thinking about what pens i'm going to use all i'm thinking about is line quality line value clarity of the illustration this part usually takes between 30 to 45 minutes and then and this is how i'm, I'm able to chunk this thing throughout the week by the way so like mm -hmm. if i'm you know waiting at the doctor's office in the waiting room and i've got a 30 minute wait well i can try to thumbnail a page right i can use that time that yeah that's that's really handy to uh, to know like well is it would it be realistic to like wh where do I fit this in my day? Uh, one other quick question I, I have please is uh, at what stage are is does it go from that four inches to the eight inches? Um, at the moment I import it into Manga Studio. Okay, so from there Let on me. you're dealing at that new that different resolution. Yep. Um, because um, one thing I've noticed if I work small I can work faster. Right. Yep. There's less, literally less space, but then I inherently can't include as much information. So very much so. Yes. Yeah, and I, and yeah. drawing digitally, one thing I've run into as well, and I've documented this elsewhere, um, the zoom is your enemy sometimes, right? So like I'll import it into eight inches, but I'll still shrink the page down to that four inch size on my screen for doing mm -hmm. like pencil roughs. Because otherwise, I will spend far too much time on this stage of the process trying to, you know, work on details that are going to be imperceptible even when it's printed, right? Mm. Um, Good point. So, yeah, th there's like some hamstringing I have to do to myself in order to make this ha happen as smoothly as possible. Because um, even had been doing this as long as I have, um, I still find myself falling into little traps like that. So... After I'm done with my pencils, spend 30, 45 minutes on that, uh, I go to my ink stage. This is one of the more time-consuming stages. This is one to two hours. Uh, and this is, you know, finishing the art with black lines. So there's another, another layers. Actually, it's a series of layers. And if anybody's, I've got a whole series of Boulder and Fleet videos uh, on my YouTube channel that you can follow. You can go watch and watch me put pages together. Um, there could be as many as 80 layers when I'm done with a comic. At this point, there might be like 40 layers. Um, so, like, on panel one here with the hippos, there would be an external contour layer uh, of the cliff face and the grass and the hippos. But then all that shading would be done on a secondary raster layer. So that way I can just, like, quickly, like, shut that layer off, use my paint bucket to drop into the big shapes. Mm. Right? Anyway, that's cool. that's yeah, yeah. sort of sideline inside baseball there. But but what, am I, what battles am I fighting at this stage? Because, again, all those other, the structural stuff, the writing stuff, the lettering stuff, the shapes and the anatomy, all that is taken care of now. I don't have to think about it anymore. All I have to think about at this stage is line value and prep for color. And prep for color was what I was describing a moment ago where like I use layers to sort of like, okay, well, like for instance in panel two there, Boulder on the left, where he's eating the pie, there's one layer that's just the contour of his body with none of the interior details, without that inner ear, the eyes, or the nose or anything. That's all done on a separate layer, so I can toggle the detail layer off, and then the contour layer becomes the the reference for my paint bucket. Does that make sense? It does make sense. It's uh, uh, it's 
it's uh um I know you're you're going through the, this awesome this awesome uh, progression. Um I I'm going to I'm going to have to ask you at some point how you came up with this this uh because this really seems like it's super finely tuned for a getting getting accomplished what you what you want with That's how you've defined this project. Thank you for for pointing that out because that's another thing is like I went back and opened up my first page of the comic and it was a mess. <laughs> the layer structure is completely it doesn't make any sense. I don't even know what I was thinking when I did that. So somewhere between doing my first page and my seventy first page, I figured out some you know streamlining process here. Um, hmm. But once I've got the inks done, and again that's about one to two hours, usually closer to two. Very few pages take less than one hour um then i get to the flat stage um at flats all i'm doing is like i said i'm just dropping in the base colors that i'm going to render at the final coloring stage so i'm just making initial color choices okay and when i say initial i mean i'm not overthinking it i'm not thinking about color theory i'm not thinking about how these colors are going to interact with each other on a complementary or a triad palette or anything like that i'm like well the cliffs are probably going to be some kind of variation of gray. Boom, here's gray. The sky's going to be some kind of variation of yellow. Boom, sky color there. Boulder, I've got Boulder's color and all the character colors on a, a swatch palette that I keep in Manga Studio. So just like drop in Boulder's base colors. I may wind up tweaking them a little bit towards the red, a little bit towards the blue, depending on the final color scheme I'm going to use. I don't think about that, though. All I'm thinking about is dropping in the flat colors so that I can edit them later. This stage takes literally 10 minutes or less. Uh, thanks to Manga Studio's terrific tools, uh, flatting takes almost no time. So, and sometimes I'll do the flatting while I'm inking. Like I finish inking page one, I'll flat it real quick because it's just hmm. that takes it's such a negligible amount of time. Then we get to probably like the most intense part of the process for me, which is the coloring. All right, so at the final stage, um, the final chunk is color. It's about two hours, and what am I thinking about this stage? I'm worried about color theory. Uh, I'm worried about emotion of color. Right. Anybody who's read the comic, well, here's an example. I mean, we look at this page. Panel one, the cliff face is a bluish gray. Panel two, I switch to like a purplish color. Right. Mm -hmm. um, I'm being intentionally um, expressionistic, I guess, about the color palette to like have it sort of reflect what I want the mood to be, and being really garish about it because it's mine and I get to do it. <laughs> um, but. Uh, I'm thinking about that, and I'm also thinking about rendering, right? I'm thinking about, like, okay, well, what kind of... Does this need, like, a lot of contrast here? Does this need less contrast? Is this a more distant object? Is this a closer object? Is this closer object? Should I make it, like, a darker... Make all the colors darker to imply that it's close and out of focus? Things like that. So this can become a very intense part of the process, and it can take as much as two hours to finish coloring, even after all the flats are done. So, yeah. Mm. Seven chunks. And now everyone's got their per, per their process. This is it. Boom. You're done. You don't have to think about it. <laughs> uh, well, so it was super funny. Like, so you mentioned it evolved partway through. Um, and I, I remember when you were posting to Instagram, exploring all sorts of things about Boulder and Fleet. Not that you've stopped that even, but like there was a certain portion of time where like you were in development for this project. Yeah. Um, earlier development. And and I'm just wondering, is that sort of when you defined your sort of um, target, like your desired output? Um, and and if so, and then was that the basis for figuring out the procedure? Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, we've talked about this before. Uh, I spent about almost two years developing the story and the ideas uh one because I was working on like a pitch for the for like a graphic novel version of it, and that was part of that time was spent doing that, and that was where mm -hmm. like a lot of those development sketches were going into that pro product. But it was also exploring rendering styles, formats. Right, I, I did some Boulder and Fleet pages that were traditional three tiered comics pages, some that were square, some that were different, you know, resolutions. Um, and it all boiled down to like what could I accomplish in four hours or less. That was like my, my target goal. It was like I know based on my own time tracking I've been doing over the years that I can squeeze a, I can squeeze four hours out of some place in my week. That that's not unreasonable. So what is the minimum viable product, as they say, 
with those constraints, <laughs> right? You want full color, and you want it to be shipped on a regular basis, and you only get four hours a week to do it. What can you pull off with that? So that was a lot of that development. It was like working with that kind of design constraint. Uh, hmm. And I remember we did an episode probably about a year and a half ago when I was kind of coming up on the final stages of developing the, the, the comic. Um, and I was struggling with uh, picking a coloring style in Manga Studio because I did not know how to use um, the paint bucket. Or rather, I didn't know how to flat in Manga Studio effectively yet. And I was going to use some like tried and true methods that I was using in Photoshop, which were very time consuming. Like the way I used to flat, it was like an hour and a half, not 10 minutes. Right. And so I was like, well, wow. that doesn't fit into my four hour constraint. And I, we talked about it on the show and I said to, to the leaners, I'm like, does anybody know a faster way to do this? And I think it was Nick. I want to say it was Nick a lot. Uh, uh, ring, that rings a bell. Yes. I think it was him. And, and if, if it wasn't, I apologize, but I think I'm pretty sure it was Nick who said, who gave me the tip on, how you can use a vector layer, make it a reference layer in Manga Studio, and you can toggle a setting in one of the submenus to stop filling at center line of vector, which gives you near perfect flats. And it completely changed the way I work. You know, it's like it, that's when I started doing the, the process of doing the contour on a vector layer and then doing the interior details on a raster layer above it so I could toggle off the raster layer. Now I've just got the contours of all the shapes take the paint bucket, bam, 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 flatted, I'm off and running. Wow. It, it does present challenges in terms of layer management because, like I said, you can have up to 80 layers in there, which is, it can be kind of ridiculous. You know, which, but. if you go back, let's see, was it one episode? Then, I mean, you shared um, essentially the, um, you've mentioned that fact before, and I, I never quite grasped why there were so many layers. Um, other than, I mean, I've encountered, you know, there's some, some art artists and some, some, some styles are, um, you know, protect are, are very protective of portions of their work and they will, they will do that by, and, and also seek to have playful flexibility later on. And they'll do that by, by just, you know, doing, uh, portions of the art in many, many layers. But I noticed that, that, that 80 number is, is a lot more approachable than it sounds, in manga studio because those are all in separate um separate uh panels right panel folders yeah panel groups yeah and folders yeah yeah i mean the the instant folders got introduced into fo photoshop and in manga studio as like a part of the layer uh scheme um it just changed everything it made it so much more easy to to work in so like for instance i got a panel pulled up on the screen just for the sake of ex explaining this a little bit more clearly mm -hmm. This particular panel, the back, okay, so the, there'd be a layer called background, and it'd be a mm -hmm. vector layer, and that would be, and I, I don't think you can see my cursor, but the, the line defining the cliff face from the sky and the exterior line around the chunk of cliff face leaning forward. Mm -hmm. That would all would be just the contours of those two things, and, and probably the hippos in the distance. So the contours of all those things. The second layer would be called background soft inks, and that would be all of the cracks you see in there. Hmm. Right. Um, actually, the easy way to tell my flats is anytime you see a difference in color, that's a different vector shape. So like those two uh, holes punched in the cliff face were drawn with a vector line on the layer below. But then all the cracks in the, the shading and the branches and everything, all that was done on a layer above it called background soft inks. In ne next layer up would be boulder and it'd be a vector layer and that would be just as contour. And then there'd be bolder soft inks. And that would be the shading of his nails or his claws, rather. And then, like, all the soft fur shading you see under his arm. Mm. Then we would have mine cart. And that would be a vector layer. Mine cart soft inks. Raster layer. And then it'd be crystals. And that would be the crystals there. And then it'd be crystal soft inks. In between each of these layers oh, would be a holds layer, right? And that's how I do, like, the effects on the stars and the little red around the, like, the excited lines around Boulder's head and also the, the color of the outline on the crystals. So that so this panel has one, two, three, four, five, six, at least six layers just in the inks, right? Mm-hmm. And again, this isn't this is by no means trying to like turn it into some kind of like uh, peeing contest about who's got the most layers. This is just a process that makes it work <laughs> faster for me. Uh yeah, absolutely. And and you know, worth uh worth mentioning that um even okay, so yes, that's a lot that that can seem like a big number, but when it's essentially organized into folders, and then those folders have such 
uh, clearly, uh, dis- clearly dis- self-describing purposes and whatnot. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, it's like it's almost like your pr- procedure can help give you hints for continuing your procedure, and that is uh, that could make the system a lot more sustainable. And and if you're you're running into problems keeping it going, then maybe you know some kind of refinement, some kind of uh, breadcrumb trail, tools, reminder, um, some refinement could. Um, could could that heal that and 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 make make the uh, uh, make it more systemic, because it's not systemic if it's not repeatable. Oh, that's a good metric. <sighs> yeah, I don't. I just came out, so uh, <laughs> <laughs> I have a very a lot of premeditation there, or or it just that that's that was what my life was leading up to. Um, so well, let's talk about your chunking then. Talk yeah, about your okay. life. <laughs> more about me um i think that the comics process is super awesome for examples and i have uh some things that are um a little less crisp but but hopefully hopefully useful because uh one of them is so you mentioned um, mvp or minimum viable product and we talked about minimum viable and minimum lovable product uh, a few episodes back can't recall the number right but like uh that is about well how do i make a sustainable service how do i put a thing and then how do i start to test my assumptions quickly and cheaply to um build some trail of um like stable ideas that are meeting the goals that i've set forth that that's is that's roughly what it is it's roughly you know scientific method for a business or process and uh, ma- turning it into something um, that can serve uh, your creative output. So there's, um, uh, I think that's a good example of a prior episode to think of like, well, there's, that's, that is chunking. It's turning into something systemic. Um, mm-hmm. the, uh, the idea that, um, like, like you pointed out, so many things that, that were, um, like essentially your budget for this project that uh that drive this this uh set of concerns that are are influences or constraints that can help you shape well what what does this how can you how can you go about making that um what compromises would you have to make could you find a way to um turn that compromise into like well no this is this is going to be beneficial and help us get to the goal whatever um like uh the the manga studio example you mentioned where there's this almost like you can pick up new tools and think well based on what i know today i know i can accomplish this creative project like i'm going to go ahead and uh and well, for instance, I, I mean, I chose using Phaser JS at a certain at a certain level of confidence, where you're like, yeah, okay, that's a part of the mix. You're now in. You're now part of this this the world of this project. I'm going to use you to make the thing. And at some point, you it's almost and that's like you're hiring the tool, right? And that's likely informed by those well what are the what's your budget for it can you afford the tool does it you know how much do you know it? whatever but then you may run into things that you weren't able to predict where where um oh you know dang it this tool it's expensive to accomplish this step how can you renegotiate that and uh <laughs> one way to do it is to just is almost luck out by podcasting about the problem and then having someone go like hey now it's cheap, and uh, <laughs> that is well, awesome. Yeah, that, so that, that, that is awesome. Um, yeah, that, that that's that's crowdsourcing to solve the problem, right? And and we're super lucky to have like really good-hearted and uh, intelligent people who want to want to help each other understand how to do things. So uh, awesome. Yeah. I mean, and, and I'm not <laughs> I'm being jokey, but like that is, uh, I mean, that's, well, I guess one way to find, you know, you can explore like, does it have to be this expensive to do that? Because mm-hmm. it sure would be great if it wasn't. 
And to me, that's kind of a uh, renegotiating thing of yeah. saying like, well, I could maybe reshape this or just get more confident in my your new understanding of what it costs. Um, but I guess all of that is to explore some of the thoughts in the chunking and what it what it looks and feels like um and then uh and as far as you want know, like when you think about the why well if you're doing it for um for yourself you probably still have some kind of budget because you have ch probably probably have other commitments to and, and, and like well where does this one fit it's a side project so i don't have to be so serious about it well maybe maybe not what do you want to do with the side project um are you maybe it's not a side project maybe you are you're bidding something for a client and all of a sudden this kind of thought process well how could you nourish your future decisions how could you make them more informed um well even if you are cutting new territory uh hopefully you're capturing stuff you're noticing like well jersey what you know you you didn't just make up those numbers right on your spreadsheet that's you're noticing cost and, and journaling that. Yeah. Yeah, that is not, those are not, I mean, even though I said times are approximate, they're not estimated. That's based on, that. They're, they're generalizations based on data I've captured for the past year and a half. Ah, right. So I guess that, yeah, the difference between a, a backward-looking um, examination of cost versus a forward-looking bid or whatever to know like, well, what should I charge for this thing? Um, chances are, if you're doing this approach, like doing some kind of intentional chunking, making a workflow out of it, doing something to, to tr make a system to produce the stuff that you want to produce, that will lead to um, greater stability in offering this as a product. Right. Because you will probably have a lot better estimate when you say, well, it's going to cost you, client, um, well, not this incredibly fair price, which is blah, blah, right? And that's... Uh, oh, that, that makes a world of difference. It, it really does. Like when you can look somebody in the eye and, and give them a number and it's based on fact, you know, because like there's like, there's, there's jokes. Uh, Neil, the, the, a quote that's attributed to Neil Adams is like, how do you set your freelance rate? Think of what you think is a fair price and triple it, you know? Um, but... I was there, and I talk with students all the time who are entering that realm. You know, I get, mm -hmm. like, former students who contact me where they're, like, just entering the world of freelance, and they're like, what do I charge for this? You know, they don't know yet. Uh, they don't have that experience. They don't have that context. They don't know what their cost is going to be in making the thing. You know, um, and you can say, well, here's market rate and whatever, and that's, that's some data. But there's nothing like knowing that, like, when a client comes to me, like, here's what we want. Here's when we want it, that I can almost instantly do some math in my head to say whether or not that's even possible and then give mm. them a number that even if they flinch, I know that's the value, right? Yeah, really helpful uh, for both you and your client. Yeah. And uh, I mean, they're, they're in, whether it is you are your own client or it is someone else, I think that's just a huge benefit worth, uh, worth practicing. Um, you know, just getting the data, even if it's like, I mean, this stuff is going to be inaccurate. I think heuristics like, well, think of what's fair and triple it. That that happens because that um, that uh, getting the well of experience for the thing. It's um, and and have you get, let's see, just if you've done something for for um, maybe you've done something long enough to maybe know confidently, but you haven't examined it. And that that was something. Um, that uh, like you mentioned the montage example earlier on, it's almost like you you think back and all you see you hear is the the A team theme and then you see a series <laughs> of finished projects, and that's not going to be enough for like right. even though you have the experience like if you would have would have been journaling that whole time, then you may have some some facts to pull out to um, to have a lot more confidence in uh, in doing some estimation um, and planning. So let's see. Um, I think that covers a ton. One thing I wanted to mention was uh, the, like, the, like, use a video game example real quick of, um, 
<laughs> I was terrible of like when I was estimating like when would I get done with this panda? Um, a variety of reasons, right? But like it 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 isn't just like this purely. Um, <laughs> what's a montage where you fail, right? It's not <laughs> okay. Well, that's that's the one when um and the one I the one I've seen this happen a lot in is the the character trying on different outfits and the friends going mm 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 as they come out, right? They come, out, I'm a cowboy, and the friends are going mm mm mm. They come out again like I'm in a business suit, mm mm mm, right? So if it's uh, if a montage stops at mm mm mm, then yeah. that's um that's a little bit what um what it felt like early on with with uh yeah. you know with that project and part of that was because i did i wasn't aware of so many hidden costs because of different things i was trying out and uh well new levels of certain kinds of polish like i wanted to do frame based animations and i wanted to do um to use this game engine that i hadn't used before like yeah i tested it but like i did not go to the extent I mean, and it's an awesome i love phaser js uh, yet I was still new to it. So kind of like you being new to Manga Studio Jersey and yep. you get to certain points where, where um, the cost starts high. And I think if you are at least keeping track of it over time that you may notice like some area to just, all right, I'm going to invest more. I'm going to figure out this problem because it's taken me too long to get my, um, my frame based animations in there. It's to get, it's taking me, um, it's, it's unpredictable how, uh, reliable these physics shapes are being like, should I just go to, you know, I, cause it, it, those are actual examples that happened in the project where I was making like custom, uh, you know, vector outlines for the shapes and it just wasn't stable for the physics engine. And I'm like, do I want to become a physics engine expert? I, well, I just want to finish a game. And so I just had to go through, navigate those kind of choices. And, uh, I made a trade-off. I went with simpler shapes. Um, and that kind of thing. But then I, I did actually decide to invest in, uh, well, what, what's, an, what's a repeatable like approach to, to getting some animations I would be happy with? So you know, I, in, in one case, uh, avoiding a cost, but in the other case, uh, choosing to invest. Yeah, okay, so I have an anal or a, a comparable uh, story on that regard. Um, years ago, years ago, a couple years ago, uh, I got the Galaxy Note 10.1 tablet the android tablet with the wacom digitizer very excited about it very excited about the idea of being able to draw comics on such a thin portable device mm. did a whole episode on it and wacom enabled tablet was the title i remember that much um and i don't know if you remember this rob but i was doing an experiment where i was trying to determine whether or not i could draw full 300 dpi comics in a program called layer paint hd which mm -hmm. Is a great drawing app. I still love it. It's on my phone. I use it all the time for sketching. But I, the lim and it wasn't the limitations of Layer Paint HD that I ran into. It was the limitations of the hardware, where there just wasn't enough memory to do something that demanded that I that used as many layers as I wanted to use. And so when I ran up against this problem, where it's like, okay, the moment I get over five layers, this thing's really chugging, and I can't do color rendering the way I want to. I've got like I think six pages of a Captain Cat comic that I drew in Layer Paint HD, um, where I was trying to do this experiment. And as I encountered the problem, I'm like, okay, well, how am I going to address this? Uh, okay, well, as I finish each panel, I'll flatten those, pa those layers on that panel, so that panel will become flattened, thereby keeping my layer count low. And in order to keep my, my editability preserved, I'll have to save multiple versions of the file. So there'll be like, if it's a six panel p page, there'll be six Photoshop files that correspond to that page, right? Mm. And it was working, but now the cost of the, the mental overhead of managing all of those files and knowing what state they were all in and coming up with a naming convention and storage because these, these, this tablet had 16 gigabytes of storage. All that led up to, you know what? The time I have and the resources I have are not enough to be able to take on these problems. This tool is fired, you know? And then mm. it's like, okay, well, now I'm going to invest in the Microsoft Surface because that has more resources to do the exact thing that I want to do, right? But it was, I mean, seven pages and several months of tooling to like keep fighting and fighting before I figured out, nope, 
I, I can't figure my way around this without it becoming more time consuming. And yet, I mean, what uh, you were, you, I'm curious. So I, I was almost blurted it as an assumption. How confident were you in moving to the surface because of your prior experience? Um, prior experience working on, um, in manga studio on freelance work, I knew the program. At least I was relatively confident in myself and be able to, to like work in the program. Well, from, even from like, well, you, you mentioned firing a tool and then hiring the next one. Did that yeah. kind of transfer with, uh, almost so like I would say my confidence level was probably like at 70%. I felt like. Hmm. It's probably going to be pretty great, and I read as much as I could on it. I read as many reviews, but as we've talked about in the show before, um, it's only recently has like reviewing of this particular kind of technology gotten kind of useful to us. Now we're getting more artists who are actually reporting on this stuff, whereas before, like when I was shopping for this, it seemed like a lot of the the the, the reporting was done by people who didn't use it for my particular use case. You know, they they would spend more time talking about whether or not it was laughable and how good the keyboard was, which is like, well, that's a concern, but it's not my main concern. You know? There was a gap in time there where it, it wasn't being adopted by enough artists. Yeah. It was really hard to get good info then. So I read as much as I could, and then mm -hmm. I also took the lowest risk approach to getting one where I got a refurbished one off of the Gazelle eBay store, so I didn't pay full price, you know, mm -hmm. so... And then they have they have a, a thirty day return policy on it, so I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to really like invest as much time as I can into this thing, run it through its paces, and I need to be able to say with confidence at the end of that thirty days that this is going to be my tool from now on, right? So there was there was a lot of calculation that was going on there. That is cool. I think that's an interesting place to pick up, actually, when we when we go to our closing section. Ah, uh, okay, so. All right, so um, this is the part of the show where I say, if you enjoyed this discussion, if you thought this was useful or at least interesting, a great thing you can do right now is go to iTunes and give the show a star review, however many stars you think it deserves. Uh, we won't know. Uh, you could write a review, too. That would be super awesome. If you're watching this video on YouTube, you could give the video a thumbs up. What do those activities do? They are... They, they take up a negligible amount of your time, but they help make our show more visible to more people. So it's a way to promote us very simply and easily. Another way you could do it that's a little bit less anonymous uh, and uh, a little bit more, probably I would say a little bit more powerful, is tweeting about it, sharing the show links on social media, telling, telling your friends about this thing that you watch, listen to, and presumably enjoy. Um, and then, of course, if you can't get enough of us and you want to hear more of us if you want to hear us every week you can go to our patreon page and that's at patreon.com slash lean into art and that's where we post the regular show the regular show the regular lean into art cast as well as extra lean which is a shorter version of the show where we walk in without any predetermined topic and we just riff until we find the moment to quit and it's always fun to play the game of when are they actually going to stop talking <laughs> Although it's more fun than that sounds, and uh, <laughs> it's and it varies. There, yeah, it's it's always it's always improvised, and uh, and it it inherently ends up being some cheeky mix of like what we regularly do because we're not not ourselves on this show. Like we we like to think about what we make, and it's just like it's just a little, it's less planned. So that uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's more like us working out. Yeah. Um, and then also on the Patreon page is our open mic post where, you know, we have, uh, you know, discussions that are available only to the patrons. So they're not public uh, where we can talk about anything that we're working on or struggling with. And uh, recently I also just, and this will tie into our closing thoughts, I shared a post about how I organize and structure my Emergent Task Planner and how I've been playing with color coding as a way to uh, track more easily visually track my time so sweet so thanks everybody who has you know given the show a thumbs up and a review or, or told your friends about it thanks that means a lot to us oh it's awesome it's really cool to read those reviews it's super encouraging and thank you all right time for closing thoughts rob so all right is um is one of the um on roads that we recommend to get into chunking um, or to get further into it, is it really about gathering the data? Yeah. 
isn't it? Yeah, I'd, I I would say so. But like, <laughs> I mean, if you don't have the data, I don't see how it's. Um, I th- well, it's funny. It it it's either um, pay the data now or pay or, or or pay for it later on when you try to actually use it. You realize you don't have it now. You got to go get it, um, which is exactly like my reflection process for last year worked. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, I went mining through all sorts of things instead of having like these um let's i we we had an episode about the experience inventory thing that i uh that I did, and that um has been easier so far overall this year where I've been doing it as I've been going along is is keeping that inventory of experiences versus which reminds me of this where it's like well, if you have like a little bit of a well who knows a emergent task planner perhaps um or Take some a drink. way yeah. <laughs> Yeah, uh, some way to just you know keep track of that time, and maybe a little bit of extra data that that helps with. Um, yeah, while we were talking, I process. pulled up one of my my data points that I use oh, cool. to help me understand how things are shaking out. Um, yeah, Boulder and Fleet, page sixty nine pencils, mm. and I tracked that day. It took three hours, and I marked at the bottom of the page. It took three hours. That's unusual. Why did it take three hours? As I looked at my day, it's like ah. I was watching the new Transformer show while it was working, and it kept distracting me. And that was when I made a mental note, like, okay, when you're doing certain tasks, you probably shouldn't have new stuff on in the background. Because, like, every time I heard something interesting happen, it was, I wanted to see. I didn't, you know. Whereas, like, when you're listening to the radio or listening to stuff that you've, that's old stuff, it's not quite as distracting, you know? That's so funny. And, yeah, I mean, like, noticing that. So, and for yep. me, it's, it's the matter of... Um, yeah, like it's funny the the new stuff factor and then the words in it factor where if it's um like some story to think of a track that stops me from writing but if it has like words that blend into music it's not really a big deal for me. And uh music fits a lot of different occasions um and doesn't tend to distract. But um that's probably more music I'm familiar with. And it just becomes a feeling instead of as being processed on, you know, other parts of, uh, uh, you know, putting some kind of load on my cognition. Yeah. That gets in the way. And, you know, I mean, this is this is something that I found is a really easy habit to pick up. This kind of capturing. It's not that hard to pick up. And, and it becomes uh, and I, I also want to advocate for the person who just has like an amazing memory. I don't. I have like a great memory for certain things, but not not day-to-day experience stuff. Mm. Um, if I say to you, Rob, what did you eat for lunch three days ago? That's going to take me a minute. <laughs> I'll be able to piece it together, but yeah. I don't actually journal that. <laughs> right, no, but no, no. Yeah. And, and that wasn't, that wasn't a, like a, a way to stick up for journaling. That was more or less to point out how you, it would take some backtracking to get there, right? It day-to-day does, yeah. stuff is super hard for me to reconstruct. Big event stuff is easier for me to reconstruct, right? So I couldn't tell you at a glance or off the top of my head what page 50 of Boulder and Fleet cost me in terms of time. But I grabbed it, you know, and so like ah, that. There you go. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that, so it's a, that's a pretty powerful tool to be able to, to get into the chunking. And uh, that's, um, and, and then from there, it's, it's sort of, well, how do you interpret the data? Like everything's going to be, well, based on what you feel is appropriate for your, for your budget. But now you're actually able to do a little bit of comparison for what you expect or your, you know, like, um, whatever constraints and goals and budget you've set up, uh, the data lets you do some comparison now. And we'll have to link in the show notes to some episodes we did on journaling. I mean, because I know we've done a, a number on that topic. So it's, we can, it's one of our themes. It is. It is. And, but it's, it's, we're, we both derived a lot of benefit from it. So, of course, we're going to talk about it a lot. And, um, mm-hmm. But uh, we've talked about it from a lot of different angles. Um, and then, again, you know, the Patreon uh, supporters get access to that post that I made about how I particularly use the Emergent Task Planner where I've been using this colored pen method of sort of like, not only chunking individual projects, but chunking discrete types of jobs so that I can like squint at a page and see where all the time has been going, how I've been using it, and uh, whether or not it's been adding up to what I intended. Wow. That would be so cool to somehow visualize that on the page. 
You know, that's what I did in that. In that it says, room. yeah, that's okay. Cool. <laughs> I haven't read. Like, it I can, yet. I can do this right now. I can cover yeah. up like, there's like an example right there of like the color codes and how a day shook out. Oh yeah, right on. But I not not right right the the oh, color codes on your. Saying. Yeah, I mean the comic page. I mean the 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 output almost like you know if you could get sort of uh, data terminator vision on top of your, um, on top of your output too. Interesting. And like yeah. see hot spots or whatever. That'd be I don't know. That'd be kind of fun. That would be. <laughs> that'd be super fun. I smell an app. I know. I just made a data nerd wish. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would do. Uh, I'm gonna have to write that down. We'll see. Who knows? Project. <laughs> All right. Cool. Well, uh, I think I think we successfully walked around that one, Rob. So. Yeah, I, I agree. And, and of, of course, as always, it, it's awesome to hear your reactions to this topic in, in specific. So, you know, be by all means, uh, add, tweet us and whatnot. That's a great place to uh, to to chat and react, or uh, you know, share share your process. Yeah, like how how, how do you use chunking, mm -hmm. right? What kind of chunks do you do you use in the pro projects that you do? Um, we'd love to hear from you guys. So, and all that contact information is coming up in just a second. Until then, I have been. Oh, this show updates every two weeks. Stream it live on YouTube. You can subscribe on this channel that you're watching it on now if you are indeed mm -hmm. watching it. Um, and, uh, and then again, you know, there's the, the extra liens are in between. And show notes will be at patreon.com slash leanintoart and leanintoart.com. So until next time, everybody, I have been Jersey Drozd of leanintoart.com and Jersey on Twitter. And I've been Rob Stenzinger of Lean Into Art and Rob Stenzinger on Twitter. Okay, bye. Show notes for this episode can be found at leanintoart.com. You can also follow us on Twitter at the user Lean Into Art, and you can reach us via email at leanintoart at gmail.com. And remember, leaners aren't wieners. Thanks for listening. Okay, I'm going to kill the stream, everybody. Thanks for hanging out with us. Yeah, thank you. Good night.